type of compost we will be making in this video is called thermal aerobic compost. In this method, your compost will heat up to at least 131 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 55 degrees Celsius. You need to get up to these temperatures for two reasons. First, it kills any weed seeds that may have made it into the pile. And second, the heat at those temperatures kills plant pathogens. Oddly enough, the heat does not kill the good microbes. The good microbes are able to go into stasis and wait out the heat. Before you start your compost, be sure the area you are building in has enough space. Thermal compost piles should be at least 35 cubic feet, and any one direction should be no less than 3 feet. Anything smaller, and you have troubles getting to temperature. If your compost container is rectangular, this translates to a 3 by 3 by 4 foot pile or larger. If your pile is round, you want a minimum of a 4 foot diameter pile 3 feet tall. You will need to turn your pile, so make sure you have enough room for two piles in your composting area. I also recommend pre-soaking your materials, so you need to consider that also when planning your composting space. You can find all sorts of designs for compost bins on the internet. If you choose one of these, make sure that it is large enough for the size pile you want. Also make sure that the container walls allow for air to get into the pile from all sides. The easiest and cheapest method I have found, and I highly recommend this, is to buy from a hardware store four foot high wire fencing, such as field fencing or horse fencing, at least 15 feet long. I would avoid using welded fencing because it tends to fall apart after many uses. If possible, wrap the wire with landscape fabric. The fabric should allow air to pass through into the pile. Do not use solid plastic. The landscape fabric helps hold the moisture in the pile for our dry climate. Roll the fence out into a circle overlapping the ends. Attach the ends together using pliers. When it comes time to turn your pile, unattach the ends and remove the fencing. The pile should retain its form. You can then move the fencing to a position near the old pile and set it up like before. This method makes turning the pile easier because you can now get to the old pile from any side. You will want to build your pile on a wooden pallet. This is extremely important. It allows airflow under the pile and prevents anaerobic conditions towards the bottom of the pile. Once you have your container in place, you can start building your pile. In addition to having all the materials that are going into the pile ready at hand, you should have a water hose with a sprayer attached. If you do not have pressurized water from a hose, you will need to pre-soak your materials for at least a couple hours before building the pile. All the materials you will be putting into your compost pile will belong to one of three categories. These categories are high nitrogen material, green material, and brown material. Compost can have different recipes usually given as percentages of these three groups depending on what microbes you wish to favor. As its name suggests, high nitrogen materials are high in nitrogen. This group includes fresh manures, legumes, and seeds. The manure has to be fresh to be considered high nitrogen. The longer the manure has sat around, the less nitrogen it will have. If it has sat around too long, it will have little to no nitrogen left. If you are building your pile with old manure, it may take some guesswork on your part to decide the amount of nitrogen. Do not use manure from unknown sources. They may either be too full of salts or they may even contain a large amount of pharmaceuticals, such as dewormers, that can be harmful to microbes. Legumes, which includes beans, peas, and alfalfa, among others, are high nitrogen food. The legume has to have been harvested while still green. If you wait until a bean plant has died and turned brown before harvesting, don't consider that a high nitrogen source. Be careful if using bales of alfalfa. If you know the alfalfa was grown without artificial fertilizers and they have nitrogen fixing nodules on their roots, they can be considered high nitrogen. If you do not know how they are grown, consider them green material. This applies to any of the legumes. 
I find using seeds that have been fermented to be the most reliable form of high nitrogen for composting. I take bags of seeds I buy from the feed store, soak them in water with one third cup of unfiltered vinegar with the mother, and let them sit for three days. Any material that is not a legume and was green and alive when harvested is considered green material. If you harvest live green leaves from a tree and let them sit around until they turn brown and dry, they are still considered green. If you pull weeds and collect them, they are considered green even if they dry out and turn brown afterwards. Fresh kitchen scraps are considered green material as well as grass hay. Any material that is not high nitrogen or green is considered brown material. This group includes any dead plant remains such as straw, chipped or small pieces of wood, paper, and cardboard. Wood chips are extremely beneficial. You should attempt to have about 5% of any pile be wood chips. If you can't, that is fine, but you should at least try that as a goal. When adding any material, make sure it is not compacted. You must leave access for oxygen to reach all surfaces. When adding straw bales or hay bales, make sure to break it up. Paper and cardboard should be either shredded or wadded up to ensure oxygen can get in. Failure to provide oxygen will result in an anaerobic compost. You also want a diversity of ingredients for each group. A diversity of food in your compost will result in a diversity of microbes. For example, if you make a compost and only use straw for the brown material, your diversity of microbes will be reduced. Instead, you should use a little paper with a little cardboard, some wood chips, and from various types of trees, whatever you can get. Diversity of microbes should be the main goal. For your compost pile, the proportions you use from each group depends on what you are going for. High nitrogen and green materials favor bacteria, and brown materials favor fungi. High nitrogen materials should make up at least 10% of the pile, but not more than 20%. If you have less than 10% high nitrogen, the pile will probably not catch, meaning that it will not get hot enough to start composting. If you add more than 20% high nitrogen, the pile will get too hot too fast and go anaerobic. Green material should be around 25 to 40 percent of your pile. Brown material should make up 40 to 70 percent of your pile. A good all-around recipe is 10 percent high nitrogen, 30 percent green, and 60 percent brown. These are the, the proportions I usually shoot for. Obviously, you will not be exact on these numbers, but they do provide a good guideline. Start adding layers of different materials making sure to wet it down as you go if you think it is too dry. The goal is for the material to be thoroughly wet but not dripping wet. When you first start making compost, how much water to add can be a bit of a guesswork. After one or two piles, you should be comfortable with water use. Add the layers in, mix the groups as you go, add some green, then add some high nitrogen, then add some more brown, etc. Mix up the different groups as you go. If you do not mix them well, such as putting all the high nitrogen together in a single layer, the initial pile will heat up with hot spots and cold spots, and you will not get good composting until you turn it. Keep adding layers until you are at least three feet high and in the proportions that you want. When you are done, it is important that you cover your pile. The cover is both to keep out excess rain and to prevent it from drying out. You might ask, well, well what's wrong with rain? If the rain is too much at once, it can cause the top layer to become overwet and lead to anaerobic conditions. Cover with a waterproof tarp, but cover no more than two thirds of the pile. Covering more than that will lead to anaerobic conditions. Once the compost pile is built, you must monitor the temperature with a compost thermometer. Compost thermometers come in a range of prices starting around $15 and then they can go up into the hundreds of dollars. The cheap thermometers usually have an aluminum tip that can be damaged easily. You can get by with these, but you must be careful using them. Put them in slowly. If you go to put one of these into the pile and you hit something, 
pull it out and try a different spot until you can stick the thermometer in without any resistance. If you have a stainless steel tip thermometer, you don't have to be as careful. The thermometer must also be long enough to reach the center of the pile. So if your pile is four feet by four feet by four feet, the thermometer needs to be at least two feet long. Thermal composting starts at 131 degrees Fahrenheit or 74 degrees Celsius. In a newly built pile, this temperature usually reached in about two to five days. Composting at this temperature for three days will kill the weed seeds and any pathogens in the compost. If you reach 150 degrees, you only have to maintain that temperature for two days. And if you're at 160, you only need to keep that temperature for 24 hours. You must reach one of these three conditions before you can turn the pile. Watch for the temperature to go over 165 degrees. At this point, you can turn it if it's been hot enough for the time required. If not, insert breathing holes into the top of the pile by poking it with a stick well down into the middle of the pile so the air reaches it. At this point, the bacteria is growing so fast that they'll be using up the supply of oxygen. If you don't act at this point, the pile will start to go anaerobic and you can lose all the good microbes. Also, if you don't act at this point, there's a chance that the temperature can go up, up, up above 170 degrees and you risk the chance of the pile exploding. You must monitor the pile daily and turn it when needed if you're doing thermal composting. Unless your pile contains more than 20% high nitrogen materials, you should have plenty of notice that your pile is getting too hot if you're checking it once a day. When you check the temperature of the pile, do not just use one reading. Be sure to check at least three different locations in the pile. Sometimes a pile can get cool spots, especially when the moisture in the pile is not even. If you only do one reading and it happens to be in a cool spot, you run the risk of the chance of overheating the pile. You should also monitor your pile with your nose. When a pile goes anaerobic, it gives off distinct odors that you should look out for. These include the smell of vinegar, sour milk, vomit, rotten eggs, decaying flesh, alcohol, or formaldehyde. If the pile smells strongly of any of these, you're probably going anaerobic and should start over. Also, when you take the thermometer out, smell the base of the thermometer. If you made your pile correctly, you should not be getting any of these smells. If you are getting these smells, chances are your pile is too wet or too compacted. Check your pile often for the proper moisture content. To do this, stick your hand into the pile as far as you can without getting burned and grab a handful of compost. If the compost is dripping wet, your pile is way too wet. Lightly squeeze the compost into a ball. If in the process of squeezing water comes out, then your pile is still too wet. If you then squeeze the compost as hard as you can and all you get is just like, like a drop or two coming out between your fingers, then you are at the ideal moisture level. If you squeeze as hard as you can and nothing comes out, then open your hand back up. If the compost stays together in one piece, you are a little dry and should add moisture. If when you open your hand, your compost falls apart into pieces, you're way too dry and compost is not happening. Once the pile gets to temperature and is ready to be turned, the outer parts of the pile are much cooler. The pile must be turned in such a way that the outer parts of the pile must be placed in the middle and the middle parts are placed on the outside as best as you can. This is best done by first removing the top one third of the pile and placing it on a tarp. Next, place the middle third of the old pile onto the bottom of the new pile. Next, put the top one-third that you put aside onto the new pile. Finally, add the old bottom one-third onto the top of the new pile. Make sure to add moisture if needed as you turn the pile. Recover the pile and monitor as before.
If you added the materials to your compost in the proper ratios, the pile will be needed to be turned at least two times. Organic standard calls for you to turn the pile five times in 15 days. Newer research is finding that if you turn it less, you end up with more fungi. For a home garden, though, turning a minimum of two times is enough to ensure that all parts of the pile have been composted. Please note that you cannot add new materials into the pile once it starts to compost unless you know the materials you added are sterile. Once the pile has been turned at least two times and the temperature no longer goes over 165 degrees, just let the pile sit. Once the temperature goes down to the regular outdoor temperature, it is ready to use. Do not use it before this time. It usually takes about six to eight weeks for the temperature to cool this much, but on some occasions it can be faster and sometimes slower. Just make sure to test the temperature before using it for the first time. Thank you for watching this video and happy composting. Work and Beauty is a 501c3 nonprofit based in West Central New Mexico. We operate on donations from people like you. Please consider donating money for our cause by either sending a check to our address listed here or through our website at workandbeauty.org. Thank you very much.